Yeah. It might not play Crisis, but it does play Battlezone, so I'm good. Oh, game over. What? Never mind. Greetings and welcome to another LGR Retro Computer Build. And this time I've got something I've been excited to put together since the moment I heard it existed. We're gonna build the new XT Micro ATX Turbo, an IBM XT class computer system that functionally wouldn't have been out of place in 1987, but is an entirely new design using modern hardware and components when possible. No emulation, no FPGA recreations, just a straight up IBM PC compatible with a mixture of brand new and new old stock parts. And this is here courtesy of JD in New Zealand, who runs an online shop there by the name Monotech PCs. He sent along a whole bunch of awesome things actually, all of which I'll be able to use on future projects, so thank you very much, sir. But yeah, right now, the star of the show is the new XT, a newly designed open source motherboard running an 8088 CPU. It's based on a number of other open source projects with no shortage of them coming from the venerable Sergei Kisilev, and the result is a basis for a phenomenally capable PC XT. Right off the bat, there's this DIP40 CPU socket, accepting processors ranging from a 4.77 MHz Intel 8088 to a 10 MHz NEC V20, with the ability to switch between three different clock speeds on the fly. The V20 is what JD chose to include here, a nice choice and a popular upgrade for IBM PCs in the 80s that'll run at either 4.77, 7.16, or 9.55 MHz. There's also a spot for an 8087 Mathco processor, which is completely optional, but he sent one of those as well, so I'm gonna go ahead and plop that in here. As far as RAM, the new XT includes 832 kilobytes of onboard memory with a maxed out 640K conventional and an additional 192K for upper memory blocks. Another standout feature of the new XT is the integrated XT CF card interface with an included 64 megabyte compact flash card, completely eliminating the need for a controller card or spinning hard disk. There's also an onboard floppy controller supporting the majority of five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch disc drives from single density and double density on up to high density and even extra high density drives. Video output is taken care of as well with an integrated Trident TVGA 9000i SVGA chipset from the mid nineties, one that's register compatible with VGA, EGA, CGA, and even MDA and Hercules. It's configured with 256K VRAM by default, with sockets allowing for a total of 512K, though running higher res 256 color graphics on this system is going to be sluggish. Of course, integrated graphics means you get a 15 pin VGA port for outputting to your monitor of choice. And yeah, this IO section alone is a nice improvement on the original XT with a 9 pin serial connection and a PS2 compatible keyboard port. Plus, the AT to XT programmed microcontroller means that you don't have to worry about converting AT keyboards to XT scan codes, so no Soros converter is required. As for sound, well, it's an XT PC, so you've got the PC speaker, with pins included to add an external speaker if you like. I'll be adding a sound card using one of the four 8-bit ISA slots, though. And yes, it only has four instead of the original XT's eight, but it's a micro ATX board, so there's only so much room. Besides, all those integrated components means you don't need as many slots anyway. Another nice addition are the ROM sockets with the 128K system ROM using flash memory that saves even without power, meaning there's no need for a CMOS battery to save BIOS settings. And above that is an option ROM socket presenting ROM upgrade opportunities, also doubling as an EEPROM programmer that can write two compatible chips. Neat. And lastly, the board generates its own negative 5 volt rail and accepts a 20 pin ATX connection, so you can use almost any modern power supply without modifying it. Yeah man, the new XT really is a dream team of retro and modern hardware, making for a nearly all encompassing PC XT solution in a compact package. But enough with the tantalizingly technical tomfoolery, it's time to put this thing together and play some classic DOS games. Okay, so before we get everything all built, let's make sure that it is functioning first of all. And for that, I've got one of these Focus power supplies by Seasonic. It's a 450 watt, absolutely overkill for what we need. The original XT only had like, I think 130 watts, but you know, it'll totally do the job. And it's one of these nice looking semi-modular units. So cool by me, let's get this thing plugged in. And you only need the first 20 pins on there. The extra four for modern motherboards will not be used here. 
Just gonna grab a VGA monitor here. This classic Packard Bell will do just fine. Plug that in, plug the power in, and yeah, let's turn it on for the first time and see what happens. <laughs> that custom startup beep sounds a little familiar. Yeah, it's like a slowed down, slightly off key Intel sound. At least that's what I'm hearing. Wonder if there's any way to customize that. But yeah, everything is looking good up to this point. We get the Micro 8088 BIOS doing its thing and checking everything out. And yeah, everything is checking out. Even got a little custom greetings here. <laughs> nice touch. Nice. Right, so for the case situation, well, I considered a bunch of different things, but ended up deciding on this Apivia XQ Pack 3 Micro ATX Cube case. I considered using like an original IBM clone case from back in the day, but I don't know, the idea of using this in a modern case appealed to me, and this particular one appealed to me for a multitude of reasons, mostly just because I think it looks cool, but it's also this white with blue accents that really brings to mind a kind of IBM aesthetic. You know, it's not IBM beige, but blue is definitely there color so yeah it looks clean and awesome to me and it's also got two drive bays up front something you're seeing less and less on modern cases now but yeah five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch i'm definitely going to use that larger one there and yeah, I don't know, just something about this overall design appealed to me like crazy. From the blue tinted windows to the form factor, and I don't know, kind of looks like a mini fridge. And yes, it does have a bunch of ports that are going to be completely redundant. I mean, we can't use USB or these audio plugins on this board, but it does have LEDs and power and reset buttons that are compatible with this board. No turbo button, but that's okay because this is a tri-mode turbo thing, and that's controlled through software. And here's another reason that I really was attracted to this case. And check this out. Look at the way the motherboard mounts in here. Yeah, it goes in there horizontally, not vertically. It's very much the way that the original IBM XT horizontal desktop form factor computers were built as well. So you have the cards going in vertically there. Kind of like a test bench as well. It gives me a whole lot of room to just plug and play with all sorts of different cards and add-ons and whatever I want to do in the future. And yeah, let's go ahead and get the power supply installed in there. And I'm gonna do my best in terms of cable management. Thankfully, it looks like this case is pretty well equipped to get cables and stuff them out of the way. And with that installed underneath the motherboard area there, we'll just get rid of a lot of these cables, especially like the audio and USB headers. We don't need those at all. So I'm just gonna, again, tuck those completely out of sight. And yes, every one of these front panel headers here will have a spot to plug in on the motherboard. Hard drive and power LEDs reset and power switch. And yeah, that's all that stuff taken care of. Just gonna get the motherboard screwed into place here. And now to make use of that five and a quarter inch drive bay in the front here, and I've got a new old stock IBM personal computer, five and a quarter inch, 360K disc drive. Something picked up from Computer Reset. Yep, absolutely knew that I wanted one of these. So yeah, we're gonna use it, hope it works. Also got a new old stock floppy disk drive cable here. It is a wide ribbon cable, but you know, we'll get it out of the way as much as we can. And the front of the case just pulls right off of there and we can get the drive tucked into place for the most part. See, this is actually configured for optical drives. So it's got one of these toolless plastic locking mechanisms that's supposed to make life easier, but uh, yeah, it doesn't actually do anything for keeping our floppy disk in place. So we will not be using that, but you know, whatever. We'll get the front of the case back on here and just use some traditional screws. Now I might install a three and a half inch disk drive later on, but really a 360K five and a quarter inch is pretty much all that I want to use with an XT class machine. All right, ribbon cable, power plugged in, and that's that. Looking good. Uh, I was really hoping this would look as awesome as it, it, it does. <laughs> I think this looks awesome. Flat black and flat white, oh yes. All right, let's go ahead and get the sound card installed. I'm gonna go with this Lazy Game Reviews Edition AdLib clone card. And yeah, here's another little weird quirk about this case. It has this cover that goes over the screws of the expansion cards. And yeah, you have to unscrew this panel, pull that off, then you can plug things in, screw the card into place, and then I, if you want, you can put that panel back, and yeah, I'll put it back. It kind of makes it look clean, I guess. And really, that's about it. I mean, with everything being all integrated onto the motherboard, there's not much else I want to add right now. Maybe something with a game port and a parallel port down the line, but yeah, that's about it. Just get the disk drive protector out of there, and eh, I've got another couple things that I wanted to install in here. I got these neat little custom case badges recently, and I thought it would look 
awesome on the front of this case with that black floppy drive and white case design and something about the reflective silver just appeals to me and yeah, the brushed metal, I don't know. It's got a retro look while also still seeming to me to be a bit sleek and modern. Just gonna put IBM and MS-DOS on here and yeah, check that out. Almost like an IBM XT class machine if it were from 2001 Space Odyssey or Star Wars or something. I don't know, man, but it's time to get the plastic off the sides. Should have peeled it slower. Yes, you should have, but it's too late for that now. Okay, time to get everything plugged in and turned on. And well, here's a slight nitpick I have about the back of the case. There's no IO panel. The motherboard didn't come with one, but it would be nice to have one of these made as an option. I'd prefer it not to be all open like this, but you know, it's fine. Let's get it turned on and see what we get. Ooh. Oh yeah, it is alive, it is looking good, and it's quite quiet. I did actually plug in the front fan. It doesn't need it, but I think it looks cool and it'll keep it cool. Now to get the floppy drive doing its thing, and for that we just press F1 to enter the BIOS setup, and it is extremely simple on this Micro 88 BIOS here. Very much like the original IBM XT startup, but without the need for a diagnostics setup disk or anything. I tested it out really quick and it is indeed writing and reading just fine. So let's get a mouse plugged in here and try out some games and software and stuff. First up here, I'm gonna try the highly useful old school PC benchmark or top bench. And yeah, as you can see here, it's giving it a score of 11 and a few different computer models that are close to it in performance. And now we can use the keyboard combination to change the clock speed on the fly. So here it is on the medium speed that then takes it down to a score of eight, close to a XT clone, which makes sense. And then you take it down to the slowest one, the 4.77 megahertz NEC V20, and that's a score of five, which is very close to a Tandy 1000 EX or SX or PC Junior with an NEC V20. So again, makes a lot of sense. And it's just cool to be able to switch between the three using control alt and either minus plus or the asterisk on the numpad. It's that easy. It is a V20 though, not an original Intel chip. So as you can see from the 80, 88 mile per hour demo here, running in the slowest mode is still 9% faster. Yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. And of course, taking it to the maxed out speed is 55% faster. That's just something to keep in mind, you know, the processor being quicker and also the video card being a bit newer than what a lot of XTs had back in the day. So as you can see here, that same demo is just not working properly. This needs an original CGA card and 4.77 megahertz Intel 8088, so it's not gonna do what it needs to. Completely expected in this case and presumably could be alleviated, but yeah, let's move on to some games. Uh, first up, we're gonna try Lemmings because it was pre-installed on the CF card. And I'm running the processor at full speed here and the ad lib is doing just fine. Ah, it's awesome. I mean, it's Lemmings, of course it's awesome, but yeah, totally playable, much more so than an original 8088, that is for sure. Not quite 286 level or anything, but you know, a whole lot more tolerable nonetheless. All right, another one to try here is 688 Attack Sub. I just want to try this out not only because of that ominous ad lib music, but also because it is a 256 color game, really showing off the VGA capabilities of this card. Again, you can install more VRAM into this and get SVGA and all that, but <laughs> it's just not going to run very well. So, you know, I might do that anyway just because. Here's an example of a nice game to play on here Sim City, the original. Got this running in EGA mode here, and I'm gonna load up one of my saved cities that I have from when I reviewed the game. And yeah, as you can see, it's loading in here. <laughs> it's definitely quicker than an original PC XT, but again, you can see just scrolling around the map here, this is the full speed. And if I take it down to one of the slower speeds, well, it's it's slower. So yeah, it's making a difference. That higher clock speed and V20-ness certainly comes in handy. Even on the slowest speed, it is still quicker than an original 8088. Okay, let's try something else here because I was messing with it on a PC Junior lately. Codename Iceman. Mmm, more ominous ad lib music. 
and some nice looking 16 color graphics. This game is from 1990 and it runs about how I expected for one of this era of SCI engine games from Sierra. A whole lot quicker than that PC Junior I was messing with for sure, but this is right on that edge of not being something you'd want to play on a system this speed. Or maybe you just don't want to play it anyway because it's not a particularly great game, but that's okay. Something that does run wonderfully on here is David Murray's Planet X3. Of course though, I mean, he designed this to run on an original PC, Tandy 1000s and stuff like that, but I'm running the VGA mode here because we can. And yeah, this is an absolute improvement over what it would be running on an actual XT with a VGA card. Yeah, this is awesome. Great example of a game to play on here with AdLib and VGA, and it's got just enough speed to be smooth and awesome and just an enjoyable game without needing to reduce the screen width or turn off transparency or anything like that. Now for an example of something that isn't very great to run on this speed of a system, but is still technically possible, we have Stunts, AKA 4D Sports Driving. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is just beyond the limits of this machine. I mean, you know, it runs, but you don't want to play it like this. Even doing things like reducing the graphics level to the lowest and turning off the sound and everything, you're still going to get single digit frame rates. So yeah, something like stunts, I mean, <laughs> you know, obviously it's not going to be great on an XT class system, really needs a 386, but still kind of fun to push the limits and see what it can and can't do. Now here's something that I wasn't sure if it would run as well as it ended up running, and yeah, it's Commander Keen Episode 4. Yeah, it sounds awesome, and actually it runs relatively smooth considering this is just an NEC V20, but again, it's really not made for this slow a system, and the side-scrolling is obviously a little jittery. It's skipping some frames and the loading takes absolutely forever, even with that compact flash card. But you know what? I totally would have played this if I had a computer of this speed back in the day, dude. All right, we got another homebrew modern DOS game here, and this is Paku Paku by Jason Knight. I mean, it's Pac-Man, it's gonna work, uh, but I just wanted to test this out because it has this tweaked graphics mode here that doesn't always work on everything, but I mean, for the most part it does, and looks great, sounds great, plays great. It's a, just a well-optimized game, so that makes sense. Unlike <laughs> something from back in the day that used a tweaked graphics mode, and this is a game called Round 42. And yeah, you end up with this half-height screen and parts of it are corrupt and <laughs> of course, it's just running too fast as well, even if the CPU is turned all the way down. This really is made for an original 8088 and CGA card. And yeah, that's just how it goes, man. These clone systems, this kind of stuff was common back in the day. There's always trade-offs. And same goes for a game like Atari Soft's Defender from 1983 here. <laughs> It's, it's way too fast, as expected. And yeah, even cranking the CPU all the way down to that 4.77 megahertz, the V20 just runs it a bit faster than intended, so this is the slowest that this computer can go, and it's still running this too fast. And things like this are precisely why I keep all kinds of different DOS and PC compatible computers lying around. There's always something that needs a little something different. And maybe I'll switch this out to a original 8088 later on so I can have that extra bit of compatibility. But yeah, for now, I am quite happy with this. I'm also quite happy that you can boot from floppy disks. You just press A during the startup of the system and it'll boot up from any kind of bootable floppy, including PC booter games like Microsoft Flight Simulator 2.0 here. Though it's made for older video cards. So you get a similar problem with around 42 and that it's horizontally weird. But again, this can be addressed. There's a dip switch on the motherboard there for different compatibility modes for different video cards. And you can just plop in another card and disable the onboard one if you want. Might make some changes later on, but for now, the only one that I want to immediately change is that PC speaker because that little piezo beeper in there is okay, but I really like the sound of a cone speaker like this one here. I mentioned it earlier, but it does have the pins on there. It's just a standard connection for this. So you can just take out the jumper and plug this in and uh, hear what it sounds like, like this. Oh yeah. 
It really does sound better. Here's a comparison with California games. Listen how much more full the cone sounds compared to the piezo beeper. Yeah, that just sounds so much more authentic to me, especially if you get it in the right spot of the case, then it reverberates off of the proper components. And dude, this is just one of my favorite projects in a long time now. I absolutely love the new XT motherboard, just as something that's a little bit different from all the other Turbo XTs that I already have. And as much as I like the options of FPGA machines and emulation and all that kind of stuff, there's something about original hardware or even just modern modifications to original hardware and homebrew systems like this that satisfy me on a very nerdy, geeky level. And that absolutely is what this is. So if you're interested do check out Monotech PCs. Uh, he's selling them for around 300 bucks is where they start, depending on what if you want it assembled or what components and all that. And I'm not sponsored here. I'm not getting any commission. He just sent this to me and wondered if I wanted to do a video and I did. And it's extremely well made and professional looking and uh, it's absolutely my kind of project. Perhaps it's not your cup of tea or even if it is, I really hope that you enjoyed seeing it all come together. I certainly had fun making it. But that's all for now. There's new videos every week, so stay tuned if you want to see more stuff in the future. And as always, thank you very much for watching.